doing the doctrinal basics and the principles of the Word of God is needed. It's definitely needed, uh, you know, as we take these topics, this will be our 21st topic. Uh, today we're going to talk about adoption. Uh, what does the Bible say about adoption? And I like taking these se separate topics because there is a vague understanding of some of these that are out there and that that could be wrong. And the beauty of studying the doctrine which the Bible gives us, the precepts, the concepts, is there's such glory in them of what God has done. And in all of this is a way that we can praise God. All of this is a way that we worship God. It's not just about our understanding, our learning, becoming smarter uh, in the Word of God. But all of the Word of God compels us to worship Him. So the more you learn from the Word of God, the more you'll worship Him. The, the more you learn, the more you'll be your, assured in your faith that God is on His throne. And that will be very significant to you if, you if you can see how he's sovereign in all his ways. And so uh, if as we turn to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to look at the topic of adoption. And I, I believe this is going to bless your heart. I know it blessed mine. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to read to verse 5. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So this morning we're going to focus on the topic, the adoption. There are no unneedful words in the word of God. Every word that is in the word of God, is, is, there's nothing there that is just superfluous, or that is, doesn't need to be there, but is, it's too much garnish. No, every word of God, every word in the word of God is to be understood, is to be un and calculated and distinguished between all the other concepts and words of God. Uh, in the Word of God, we, we have things such as regeneration, justification, sanctification, glorification, and we have adoption. Now, where does adoption fit into the salvation of God? And so, we're going to look at this word. Now, Paul is the only one who uses the word adoption. He uses it five different times, but it has three different applications. We see him use adoption of Israel as the nation of Israel. He uses the word adoption, and he uses the word adoption for our bodies, and then he uses adoption for the, per the person. And when he talks about the adoption of people, in the Word of God, he brings he breaks it down into two different categories. There's the legal adoption, and then there is a uh, phileo, uh, what are you, phileo, the whatever the word is for that family-oriented relationship. It's the spirit of adoption. So you have the legal side of adoption for persons, and then you have the experiential aspect of adoption of persons. Now, a broad definition for adoption is bringing into sonship. Someone or bringing a child who is not biologically or by nature yours. Okay, so adoption is as you have brought a child into your family who is not by nature yours. Uh, they're not biologically yours, but once you've brought them into your family, they become heirs of the family and they have a uh, feeling of being family with you all. So 
You know, it's, it's kind of like, a, I'm never going to get Steve Jobs money. He's never going to send down, you know, Steve Jobs uh, made up Apple. I'm not a part of his family. If I were a part of his family, then maybe I'd, I'd receive the inheritance that was due to me. Uh, I'm not biologically a Jobs, a Steve Jobs person. I can't be in his family. But adoption is, he can adopt me, which I'm not in his family, but bring, him in, bring me into sonship. That's the broad definition, is when you bring, again, somebody who is not biologically or by nature yours and bring him into the family and call him yours. Okay? So the first application, turn with me to Romans chapter 9, we see of adoption, is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. Romans chapter 9. And again, Paul is the only one who uses this word. So it, we're only going to see the word adoption in Galatians, Ephesians, and Romans. Now, in Romans chapter 9, verse 1 says, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse. Uh, hold on. For I, yeah, for I could wish, I thought I read that wrong. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ, for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So we know he's talking about the nation of Israel, because Paul was an Israelite. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption, there's our word, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Adoption, the tense of this word, the use of this word in this application is not talking about salvation. He's not talking about salvation because he says that he wishes that his brethren according to the flesh. And it says, verse 4, who are the Israelites who pertaineth to the adoption and the glory? Adoption in this sense is not salvation because look at chapter 10, verse 1. Paul's desire, brethren, my desire, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. So they're not saved, but they've been adopted. So how, how, how can both of those things be true at the same time? Well, in this tense, this use of the word here, he is talking about the nation has been adopted. That God has put sonship upon, in a generic term, upon the nation itself. God has separated the nation of Israel. Remember, he separated Abraham, and he made a nation from Abraham. And he blessed the world through the seed of Abraham. That's where Jesus Christ would come through. The nation had been adopted. They'd been separated. The language in the Old Testament, we see many references that God calls Israel his son. Exodus 4.22 says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And in Deuteronomy 32, he says, Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? And Hosea, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And that has two, that's a double meaning there. Because we know that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy because he called his son out of Egypt, fleeing from Herod. But also, we know that God had delivered Israel from Egypt, literally. So, there's Old Testament references where God calls Israel his son. In a way, he has adopted the nation. And it is a peculiar nation to God. It's been consecrated to God. But here's the, here's the distinction. Even though it's using the word adoption here, and God says that he's the father of that nation, it does not mean that the true children of God were all in Israel. That there were an elect within the elect. Okay? There were an elect, a spiritual elect people these would be God's people who he chose in Ephesians chapter 1 before the foundation of the world to have mercy upon, to bring all things which he has determined in Christ so that we may be presented before him unblameable and holy in love. 
That was God's purpose and design. And so we've been spiritually elected, chosen by God for the foundation of the world. Well, the nation of Israel was chosen to do the purposes of God. Now, the people within Israel, not all of Israel were saved. Not all of Israel were actual children of God in the spiritual sense. And we read that, if you're still in Romans chapter 9, verse 5, he says, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh, still talking about the people, the nation, Christ came. Christ came in, in this nation. Who is over all? Jesus is over all. God bless forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So there's an obvious distinction of this word. And do you see how important it is to define terms within the context? That you don't take that word adoption and say, well, in other places he's talking about salvation. In other places he's talking about sanctification. Uh, obviously, all of Israel is going to all of Israel saved, and that's what he's saying. But no, it's not, because he clarifies in verse six. Not all Israel's is Israel. In verse 7, just because you were born in the nation of Israel, even though God said, Israel is my son, if you were nationally born, you were naturally born into that nation as a Jew, you are not children. You're not the real children of God. So there needs to be that distinction. One is not a child of God because of his fleshly descendant from Abraham. Um, look at verse 8. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So he makes the distinction himself within this, this paragraph, and I hope you see that too. That even though he's using the word adoption, he's using it in the sense of the national election. God, he elected the nation of Israel to do his purpose, to do his will, to have the Messiah born through. They were a peculiar nation, and there is a special place that God holds for the nation of Israel, and it broke his heart uh, when they turned him away. I mean, Jesus even said, uh, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've how I would have gathered you together as, as the chicken uh, had their chicks, and, but you would not. You, you refused him. You did not believe. And, and so we, there is a special place. And Jesus went to the house of Israel first. And we even see in evangelism with, with Paul and Acts that they went to the Jew first and to the Greek and to the Gentile. So there is a special place. No one's denying that that's a special place. But uh, this adoption does is special in the sense that it does not mean salvation. That God's true children are not those who are born after the flesh, but born in the spirit, born after the spirit. So we needed to make that distinction. Uh, also, and you don't have to turn there in Matthew 21, Jesus says this to them who did not believe. He was talking to the Pharisees. He says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Jesus said the kingdom of God is going to be taken you and given to another nation. Now, what was the nation Jesus was talking about? He was talking about the spiritual. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he calls us a holy nation, a consecrated people, a peculiar people, that we have been called out from darkness into his marvelous light, that we should show forth the praises of God, that we were not... Uh, we, were, we used to be not, we used to, sorry, be separated from the commonwealth of Israel, but he has brought us together. We form a spiritual type of nation because we're a group. We're a group of people. And as Jesus, and that's what Peter had talked about, so this nation of God is not a, uh, the true nation of God is not a natural nation, but the nation which Jesus says, this nation, everything that you have, the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another nation, and they will have fruit. They will have fruit. So the first application that we see of adoption is 
the national adoption which God had of Israel. The second one is of the body. Now turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse, and I know I've, I've been here for quite a bit, and Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Now this is an element of adoption where God's people will receive a body that is not by nature ours. So once again, we're re adoption is receiving something that's not by nature yours. So now we're going to be receiving a body, a glorified body. In chapter 8, verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That means the revelation. Uh, I want to stop there. Manifestation does not mean creation. It means the revelation of something that's already there. Now are we the children of God. You all get that? Isn't that a beautiful little word study? The manifestation is what's already there but hidden. Verse 20, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So we see a second way which Paul uses the word adoption is talking about our bodies. Us receiving uh, what is not ours by nature. And the victory of receiving this body, isn't that the deliverance of the groaning <laughs> that he's talking about all throughout here? And receiving this body, is that not also the revelation of who we are? We're sons of God. So who we are is hidden by the corrupt body which we have and we groan under. But our glorified body will manifest our glorious body and so we will appear before all to be who we are the groaning will be gone and we will testify that we are children of God through the glorified body so he gets rid of the corrupt and he brings on the new but by nature we're corrupt by nature we have these bodies of death but Paul says who shall deliver me from this body of death well it's just a wonderful gift of God knowing as children of God uh, that forever and ever we will not be limited and restrained and have to deal with conviction of doing wrong in the, the new body which we will receive. We'll be able to enjoy him and his fellowship forever and ever. Uh, it'll be the Garden of Eden with no snakes that are going to be tempting. So that is in this sense the adoption. We are waiting for the adoption. We're waiting for receiving something that's given to us that's not by nature ours, but it's an inheritance. So we see that second application of the body. Now, the third one is of persons. Now, we're going to spend the longest here on the third one. Uh, back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. And we're going to read a little bit more. Now, in this sense, it does mean salvation. But we're going to look at this. It's beautiful. Uh, you know, I, love the, I love the doctrine of adoption. Because we're getting ready to see something here. And it'll bless you. All right. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will... Now look at verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Adoption of persons means that adoption was according to God's eternal 
purpose of love. In eternity past, God had determined to adopt us as sons. Adoption, him, God bringing us to himself, who by nature are not his, but he has brought us to himself, it all rests upon the blood. It all rests upon redemption. Had there not been a blood redemption, had there not been a sacrifice, had there not been Jesus Christ, who is our Savior and our High Priest, we could not have been reconciled to God. God could not have called us as sons to himself because we must have a sin substitute. We must have our Savior. We must have imputed righteousness. We must appear before God as if never we have never sinned before. And the only way you can do that is with Jesus, is with Christ, because that's what Christ accomplished. Now, adoption of persons, when he's talking about this adoption in verse 5, the adoption of children is in two ways, both legally and we experience it. And there is no other doctrine that does that. Justification is all legal. There's no feeling in justification. There's no inward work with justification. Regeneration is all inward. It's a new birth. It's a new creature created in Christ. Adoption bridges both justification and regeneration because we have both aspects. Adoption is a legal process by God as judge but it's also a process where the Holy Spirit sears into your heart and you cry, Abba, Father. You have the spirit of adoption. And those are the two ways of persons God adopts you. Not only does he legally adopt you and you're now his, but he also gives you that feeling that you're his. You no longer have the spirit of fear. You have the spirit of being a child to our father. So adoption is both. It's both legal and it's both experiential. It's both legal, both subjective. Uh, honestly, when you think of adoption, I kind of think of the, you know, it's, it's a legal sanctification. It's God who has brought us from where we were to himself. He has established us within the family of God, given us heirship with Christ. But not just that, we, he gives us an experience of being a child and him being our father. And so that's the beauty I, I see of adoption. We have the legal and the subjective. Now, a, adoption may be defined as that aspect of salvation in which God, by a legal process, makes one his son who by nature is not his son. He has brought us in. Adoption in itself is nothing more than a legal act, but when God adopts a son, he also gives us that feeling, that experience of that family devotion, filial or phileo. Um, this is where adoption and the new birth come together. Like I said, the adoption's a bridge between both worlds. When you compare it with justification, now justification and adoption, they're both similar, but they're distinct. Justification only deals with our legal standing before God. It's God as a judge. It has to deal with courtroom acquittal or condemnation. Pardon, not pardon. Guilt, not guilt. It only has to do with that. Uh, we've, with justification, that our sins were charged to Christ who paid for them on the cross. And his righteousness was charged to us in the account. As far as God sees... We have not sinned against him because we've been charged with the innocence of Jesus Christ. We have the same innocence that Jesus had on the books. Jesus had the same guilt that we have on the books. So he paid for them. He paid for them all. He paid and it was finished. Jesus is no longer charged with our sin today because he paid for all of them and the payment was satisfactory. All the debt was gone. And so, you know, when sometimes when you hear, well, he became sin, well, he himself, Jesus was never had sin intrinsically. Jesus never, you know, when, even though he took my sin upon him, doesn't mean that he took my lying and 
He took my wicked thoughts. He took my evil thoughts. No, he was charged those things. That's justification. Justification is salvation that God has, has done for you that was accomplished on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're justified by his blood. That's the only way to be saved is through the imputed righteousness, the charged righteousness of Jesus Christ to my account. I do not, I, I, I do not have the infused righteousness of Jesus Christ within me. It's been charged to me. It's not been put in me. Okay? In these bodies, we will never reach perfection. We will never reach a sinless state. And so... Uh, we've got to separate justification. Justification is not something you feel. Justification was something that was done for you as a legal transaction. Now, how does that deal with adoption? Adoption was also a legal transaction, which God made. Now, the difference between justification and adoption. Now, the judge is over here, and the judge has the right and the authority to acquit or condemn you, but not make you his son. That will take a whole other legal process. Justification is just that, acquittal or guilty. But adoption is another legal process where he does the judge, the loving, our loving father brings us to himself and he uh, puts us into his family, that we are heirs now. We've been brought into the family of God and that's all by his grace. As one of the differences of adoption, when we think of adoption and, uh, you know, bless people who, who go out and uh, they adopt children. And, um, but there's typically something, there's some kind of variable when a parent chooses who to adopt. There's going to be some sort of physical characteristics or things like that that they're going to see that, you know, endears that person to the child and they want to adopt the child. But it, that was not so with God. That's the big difference between God adopting us. There was nothing good in us. It was all by God's grace, and it was all blessing to us. It wasn't a blessing to him. You know, it wasn't a two-way street. Like the parents are happy they adopted, and the child is happy they adopt them because it was a mutual benefit. All the benefit is ours in God's adoption. You understand? I mean, we understand that God needs nothing. God does not need us. God does not need us to worship him. God does not need anything. That's what Paul said. We need him. And that's 100%. There's no two-way street. God does not need us. We need him all the way. <laughs> so when he adopted us, it was not by uh, my characteristics or my qualities, uh, but by purely by his goodness and grace. That's it. That's it. So when we, give, when we seek to give credit to anybody for this salvation and the fact that we're in heaven forever and ever, the fact that we have hope, that right before we die, we know that we're going to uh, be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord and our eternal state is going to start and we're going to look back and just see what a blip in eternity our time here really was. Who's going to get credit for that? Only God. Only God. Because despite me, he brought me. Uh, a lot of people have deceived themselves thinking they're something when they're nothing. Or deceive themselves thinking what they're giving God needs. We need him. A hundred percent. Now, I may need you. And you may need me. And that's true. I mean, that's... Very true. Let's always just assume that's true. Let's pray for each other, love one another, support one another as if you need me and as if I need you. That we should do that. But with the Lord, that's, that's not the case. All of our thanks, we just <laughs> fall down to our knees. And if you can look up, look up and just thank him. Kiss his feet that he has saved you and spared you and given you a salvation and a kingdom to enjoy and be in his family forever and ever and ever enjoying all the spoils of being one of his children um, so that part of adoption I love I, I pray that that was a, a blessing to your heart but it's distinct it's distinguished from 
justification. Justification is all legal. Adoption is both. Adoption is a legal transaction of being brought. And justification has to deal with the removal of guilt. Adoption's legal process has to do more with making you a member of the family of God. Now, there's also regeneration and adoption. Regeneration is the new birth. The new birth. That deals with the change of nature. That's regeneration. You must be born again in John chapter 3. You must be born again. That has to deal with our change of nature, where adoption has to deal with the change of our title. Okay. The new birth is something in regeneration. It is a it is a creation of it deals with our nature, our new nature in Christ. And Adoption has to deal with our position. Um, so they're kind of similar, but they're distinct. You must be born again to be adopted. You must be born again to have been brought into the family of the Lord. The believer joins the family of God through birth and adoption. The Holy Spirit makes us alive. We're the spirit of adoption. The Holy Spirit enables us to pray and cry to Abba Father. Our new birth, the Holy Spirit makes us a child as the spirit of adoption gives us the cry of a child. I like that. Regeneration makes us a child. Adoption gives us the cry of a child. So like I said, adoption is both legal and you feel it. You've gone from fear of God and condemnation and him being far off on his throne, untouchable, unreachable, with that spirit of adoption. Um, did we turn there, Romans chapter 8? Did we read that about the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father? Uh, we no longer have that spirit of fear. We have the spirit of he's our father. Of course I can approach him. Of course I can come and hug his leg. Of course, because that's who he is to me. And that's the Holy Spirit that gives you that experience it's amazing once you stop and think about what God has done for you what a what a good God what blessing he has given you I mean he's not a far off he's and it's that it makes our assurance so rich when we go to him in our tears crying to him as our father who would provide whatever he needs to provide now think about before you're saved you had none of that there was none of that. Nobody lost does that. And so he has given us the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Then there is the resurrection. We will receive the new bodies. Resurrection is the raising of our bodies where adoption speaks of the nature of our resurrected body. Resurrection is, speaks about what will happen we will be raised from the dead. Adoption, where we will receive our new body, deals with the nature of our new body. It's going to be a glorified body. We're going to be adopting a body suited. And it, what did John say? It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And so Jesus has a glorified body being raised from the dead. Now, if you don't die and Jesus returns, you'll have what's called a translated body because you will not have died here. Only people who die before the Lord comes and are raised again will have a resurrected body. If you're alive and remain, you'll be caught up, kind of like Elijah was caught up and Enoch was caught up. They didn't die, but they received a translated body. Um, so it'll be a different body. It'll be an incorruptible body. And that's what Jesus says. The body you have now has got to be sown. It's got to be the corruptible cannot inherit incorruption. And the body that can inherit incorruption is what Paul calls our adopted body. To wit, the redemption of our body. So these three methods of adoption, which we've seen, of Israel, of our body, and of persons. Within... When it talks about persons in Ephesians chapter 1, remember how adoption bridges the legal and the experiential. 
Justification doesn't bridge both. Justification's just legal. Regeneration's just experiential. Adoption's both. We've been brought together uh, by God to himself legally and experientially, where we cry, Abba, Father. And I, I, that's the beauty of adoption. With the legal adoption comes the spirit of adoption. Do you cry unto him as your father? Now, just one application before we are dismissed. How do we show the world we've been adopted and are in the family of God? 1 John chapter 2 says, Love not the world, nor the things that are of the world. If you love the world, you have not the love of the Father within you. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Be ye separate. Come out from among them. Knowing our state of who we are, being adopted, knowing that he is our father, how are we showing the world that we truly are children of God, that we've been brought into his family, we are the recipients of his blessings, of all of the inheritance which he has, we have through Jesus Christ. We've been called out to be different by God. We've been called out to be lights. We've been called out to be salt. We've not been called out to enjoy the world and the things of the world, and now you just have a death uh, insurance. That's not who we are. That's not what salvation is. Salvation is not hell insurance. Salvation is living the life which God has given you to bring him glory as someone who is devoted to him more than devoted to your flesh, more than devoted to the desires that you have. Are we going to fail? Absolutely. Pray that the Lord forgives you and helps you to overcome those things. We're not to be passive to sin. We're not to just give up and say, well, sin's just going to have me, and I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do. Uh, the Lord has saved you to be his son and his family. He's adopted you. And so we should live our life reflecting that. And as the Lord says, come out from among them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this hour of study. Lord, we pray that you've been glorified. And Father, we ask that your will be done, that we may present before all Jesus Christ, lift him up, so that you can draw all men and women to him. And Father, we will give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.